United States Department of Treasury. That's right, the place they make money. That green stuff you scramble to get and then give back every year so cheerfully. Yes, Treasury is money, but a lot more than that. There's a lot of other bureaus, too. For instance, Customs, Secret Service, Coast Guard, the Alcohol Tax Unit, Foreign Funds, and Narcotics. That's where I work. My name, by the way, is Barrows. And as for what Treasury does stand for besides money, I'm going to tell you a story about myself out of the files of my own department. First, I'd like you to meet my boss. He doesn't happen to be in right now. He's over at Lake Success, Long Island, home of the United Nations, where delegates are arriving for a special meeting of the World Narcotics Commission. You'll meet him here among these delegates who have come from all over the world. There he is, the one in the middle, Commissioner Harry J. Anslinger. And as for what brought these important people together, it really boils down to just a little flower, an innocent, pretty little thing, the poppy. Oh, not the kind you've seen. After this one blooms and the petals fall, the pod is ripe. When you bleed that pod, the liquid that oozes out is processed, and the finished product is opium. How deadly? Well, back in 1935, my boss said, we came to realize that the enemies of decency we're using opium as a weapon to keep the world divided and its citizens slaves. And that's just what these delegates came about, to sign a treaty, to lick this world evil by standing together, the only way you can do it. Took them a long time to learn that lesson, and this is the story of how I learned it. That same year, by the way, 1935. That was the year I took over the Bureau in San Francisco. It was just a routine day, and my assistant, Harry Hart, brought in a message just off the wire from Anslinger. A freighter with no name or markings had tried to make a landing along the South American coast and was being driven north. It could be another Japanese narcotics ship. She'd been spotted off Peru, Mexico, and the last time off California. Might try for landing around here to refuel. I passed the information along to Coast Guard to be on the lookout and keep me posted. Just a routine incident which was pretty much out of my mind by two days later when I started a short vacation, puttering around at my favorite hobby, my rose garden. It was Coast Guard calling. They'd spotted a freighter at early dawn and then lost her in the fog. Could be the narcotic ship we were looking for. We hunted her the rest of that day. It was almost dark and we were about ready to give up when we spotted a tramp heading out to sea. No name, no markings. Must have been hiding in one of the island coves and now was making a run for it. We signaled her to stop. She was still inside our 12-mile limit, and if she could make it, she was protected by international law. No answer to our signal, and just in case she didn't see it, she had to see that, and her answer was all the speed she had. We'd never catch her in time, but we kept after her, acting like we meant to board her and see what the bluff would do. She was well past the 12-mile limit now, but what we didn't know was the bluff was working. If we meant to stop her illegally, she couldn't run the risk of having something found on board. I gave the glasses to the captain, it was all over. I told him what I'd seen. No matter what I'd seen, he had no authority to stop her outside the limit. I asked him at least to catch up with her and come alongside and let me get a better look at her. Just a tramp freighter, and on the bridge, a couple of her officers. The captain, who had given the orders to jettison that Chinese cargo, a face I'd never forget. And out of the water came the only piece of evidence that said I hadn't dreamed the whole thing. And it told me what I wanted to know, that she was the Kira Maru out of Shanghai. And that's where I was headed the next day, wiring Ann Slinger that I was going. I was hot after the murder of a hundred men. And just after dawn of the sixth day, Shanghai, still a free city in 1935, but with Japanese guns to the north and getting closer. The man I had to see was a Japanese consul, 
But unfortunately, he had no record of a Japanese ship of that name. Very sorry indeed. But he didn't doubt my story for a minute. They would take action against the Kiramaru captain for his brutal act. They brought him to trial, in fact, about a week later. He wasn't there to defend himself, of course, and they couldn't be sure he even existed. But they tried him and passed sentence. This court, having carefully considered the evidence presented, finds the defendant guilty and sentences him to prison for a term of 30 days. 30 days? In America, that's what you get for reckless driving. Such sentence to be carried out if and when the defendant is apprehended. This court, however, wishes to put on record that no evidence has been presented to show that any vessel of Japanese registry named Kiramaru does in fact exist. That night, I decided the best thing I could do was head back home and call it a licking. Pardon me, Mr. Barrows. We met in the courtroom today. I followed your story with great interest. You see, I've always thought that the climate of South America was admirably suited to the growing of the poppy. No doubt the slaves were intended for such work. That's South America's business. And yet you came 6,000 miles on this business. Because that happened in my own backyard. A long time ago, they brought the poppy to my backyard, to China, and put her to sleep. It seems to be South America's turn now. And after that, perhaps your country. Thanks for the warning. When you saw the Kiramaru, you could count a hundred slaves. Maybe 90, maybe 110. Close enough. Sometimes a man counts with his pulse. And you would recognize that captain again? I would. Three days ago, a Japanese captain was landed here illegally from a fishing boat. Why should such a man take employment as a rickshaw runner? Where would I find him? It might be wiser to discuss that at my office. I am there evenings, too. Twenty-five Peacock Lane. Mr. Barrows? Come in, Commissioner. I would like to play a record for you. That's not what I came here for. But you'll be interested. This was recorded in Egypt. The last words of a dying man. He says he broke his chains, jumped from the ship, and swam ashore. What was the name of the ship? Kirawan. The Kiramaru. Won't you sit down, Mr. Barrows? He says there were 200 slaves. The Kiramaru brought them to plant a poppy field in Egypt. Ask him where in Egypt. He doesn't know. He keeps saying Jean Hawks. Who is Jean Hawks? Jean Hawks is the sign, he says, a code. Maybe a man, maybe a woman. Does he know where the opium from those poppies is to be sent? This is the part that interests me. You know where the opium went to the Rumor on the ship said to Shanghai for refining. Where in Shanghai? Shanghai. 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 Shangh
Only 100 would be needed to harvest it. So once it was planted, the other 100 were loaded back on the Kiramaru destination, South America. What's that got to do with the man you were going to help me find? If that rickshaw runner is the captain of the Kiramaru, he's the only link I have between Egypt and the refining of that opium in Shanghai. Why let the stuff get here? Why not round it up in Egypt before it's even harvested? I was afraid you would ask that. The British and the Egyptians have searched for three months, and they have not found a single poppy. And you're expecting the raw opium from the poppies to show up here in Shanghai? Very soon. The British inform me the petals will fall from the poppies tomorrow. Well, if they haven't found the field, how would they know? Uh, by the poppies, they grow there for medicinal purposes planted about the same time. Uh, now, in Egypt, the harvest must be completed five days after the petals fall, or it will rot. So you see, that opium will be on its way here in five days. Oh, a poppy field that size that no one can find, a story from a dying slave. You expect me to swallow that? I swallowed a hundred Chinese going overboard in chains off the American coast. Okay, Commissioner. Now, suppose I see this rickshaw runner, mm -hmm. and I say, yes, that's the man. You want me to leave him free to see what he leads to. You'd prefer to bring him to justice immediately, through the law or in a dark alley. In either event, warning the rest of the ring. What do you suggest? That before I direct you to him, you agree to take orders from me for as long as I require you to. Oh, sorry, Commissioner. I only work on cases when I believe in them then we can't identify this man. And considering how we both feel, that's unfortunate. Pardon me, gentlemen. May I suggest compromise? For just five days, Mr. Burroughs pretends he believes in this case. He follows orders. After five days, the case is finished, or there is no case. Then Lum Chi says, Mr. Burroughs, the Japanese captain is now your private property. Well? Joe finally said something. Okay, gentlemen. I'll pretend you have a case. Where do we start? At Sokim Hong, the largest rickshaw garage in the Orient, owned by Nicholas Sokim. Now, let me give you a few facts about Mr. Sokim. The next morning, I was on the job, heading to Sokim's garage. I had a new name, Tom Brent, and a new profession, dealer in rugs. And what I'd promised in this little game was five days of my time under Lum Chi's orders. Good morning, sir. Good morning. I'm looking for a Mr. Sokim. I'm Nicholas Sokim. What can I do for you? Do you have a Japanese working here as a runner? I don't believe so. Very few Japanese work as runners. This man might have been hired four days ago. He came in on a fishing boat. Obviously not legally. That's right. Unfortunately, this is an excellent place for such people to hide. Come into my office, please. The man was a fisherman? Or a ship's officer. Couldn't be the captain of the Kiramaru. A rickshaw garage is much like a taxi company in your country. We learn things. And you might be Commissioner Barrows. The name is Brent. Tom Brent. Oh. And are you under the impression, Mr. Brent, that this Japanese is hiding here with my knowledge? I didn't say that. Nor did you say that you recognize me. Should I? If you went back far enough in your records, though that could have been before your time, 10 years ago, this was my last connection with narcotics. Since then, I've been respectable. I have many business interests besides this one, all profitable, all legitimate. If your man is here, or any sign of him, look for yourself. Did you see any Japanese out here? I don't think so, no. Uh, most of my runners are inside. Go on in, sir. Shut that door. If 
you wish. You're in Shanghai now. Everything is all right. I'm sorry. We came in from the north just last night. I was looking for Mr. Shannon. Who? Shannon's world tour. I understood they would start from here. Mr. Greek, Shannon's world tour. Have they been here this morning for rickshaws? They're scheduled for tomorrow morning, sir. I see. Thank you. Come on, Chupin. I'll open the door again for you. Never mind. He isn't in there. Mr. Greek, how many are on us here we out on the street? About 25, sir. Any Japanese? No, sir. Have we hired any Japanese who have left? You're aware we keep no accurate records. Well, this was just four days ago. This man is above average height, not too young, good physical condition. Come, Mr. Greek. Well, I'll do my best, sir. I'm much obliged, Mr. Sorkin. Not at all. I am concerned with my own reputation, believe me. Where can you be reached, Mr. Barrows? At the Hotel National. The name is Brent. Tom Brent. Good day, Mr. Brent. Good day. Nothing to do the rest of that day but go back to my hotel and wait with four-week-old American newspapers for company. Hello? A man who worked for us just a few days this week. The other runners are certain he was Japanese. Do you know where he is now? As far as we could find out, he is living in a rooming house at 17 Barry Alley. And he goes by the name of Sago. I'm afraid that's the best I can do. I'd been watching for nearly an hour. Would I know him if I saw him? A face I'd seen once in bad light for just a few seconds. That could be the man. It was the same stocky build. Mr. Shannon is expecting me of the Shannon World Tour. What is his room number, please? 506. I could almost swear that was the man. Any American tours in town? Well, there's a New York tour and a Shannon's World Tour and... I've heard of Shannon. What's his schedule? Uh, it's all in here, sir. Big party? Well, I... Let's see. There's one, two... Four, six, eight. Well, that's fine. Thank you. You're welcome, sir. Mr. Shannon himself. Very useful, this photograph. It might show up in Lum Cheese Records. And before I forgot them, the names of those eight tourists on that register. Just ten minutes later, he was back down. That didn't take long. Evidently, he and Mr. Shannon knew their own minds. I followed him back to 17 Berry Alley. I was itching to lay hands on this murderer, but he wasn't my private property yet, not for four more days. Lum Chi would watch him now to see if he led to something called the Gene Hawks ring. My job was to report back with his first clue, Mr. Shannon. And the next step, to look for Shannon and the records, the narcotics code book, records that go back years with the histories of thousands of men and women in the racket. A sort of international rogues gallery made possible through world cooperation. After nearly an hour of searching and comparing, there he was. Real name, Shea. World touring, a dodge to make narcotic smuggling easier. And some of his tourists must be tied up in this racket with him. What we had to know was what they looked like too. And that was my next assignment the following morning, to join Shannon's tour for the day and memorize those eight faces. Good morning, Mr. Kim. Oh, good morning, Mr. Brent. I want to thank you for yesterday. You went to a lot of trouble for me. I hope you found the Japanese. No, he wasn't there. I'm sorry to hear that. 
Well, you did your best. I uh, guess I'll be heading home tomorrow. Might as well spend my last day seeing the sights of Shanghai. I'll have Mr. Greek personally conduct you. Uh, the blonde is much prettier than Mr. Greek, don't you think? Oh. Oh, I understand. So, Kim, I'm Shannon. How do you do? My party's ready. I'll have the rickshaws back by 5 o'clock. So, Mr. Shannon, my name is Brent, Tom Brent. Oriental rugs is my business. I'm on the loose today. One of I might tag along. And this is a private tour. Well, Mr. Brent is a rather good friend of mine. I'd appreciate you helping him. Very well, I'll get another rickshaw. Much obliged. I saw that man ten years ago. A narcotic smuggler, then. His real name is Shea. Really? As I recall, rather a bad man to fool with. Very impulsive and dangerous. Thanks, okay. This is my day off. A pleasant day's work ahead. A tour of Shanghai and a chat with my companions as we went along. This was Edward Clark, Twin Lakes, Ohio, furniture business. Anna Harrison, school teacher from Fall River, Massachusetts. Harry Weber, Allentown, Pennsylvania, and Mrs. Weber. Mrs. Mary Payne, librarian, was seen Kansas. Jay Martin, automobile dealer, Pittsburgh. Herbert Ribbon, retired, Aldi, North Carolina. Louis Lawrence, Boston, restaurant owner. That was all eight of them, a face for every name, to be checked later in the code book. And at the Willow Pattern Tea House, a stop for refreshments, my first chance at those two I'd met yesterday who were not on the list but we're definitely with the tour. Rather crowded in here. Isn't that a Rosa Chinensis? You see, I go in for roses. The name is Tom Brandt. I travel for a rug firm. Hello. She seems all right today. Just what was the matter with her yesterday? Chopin speaks English. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't know. Oh, that's quite all right. As a matter of fact, we think it's good to discuss it. The Japanese captured Chopin's village and took her family away in boxcars. Seeing that sliding door yesterday and the coolies there in the dark kind of upset her. Oh, I see. Chopin. That's a nice name. I think I'll just call you Princess. I didn't get your name. It's Anne Grant. It's Anne Grant. How do you do, Miss Grant? Mrs. Grant. Oh, Mrs. Grant. Oh, well, this is a nice tour, isn't it, Mrs. Grant? You going all the way to the States, Princess? Yes, to my new home. And where's that? San Francisco. Well, what do you know? That's my hometown. Have you ever been there, Mrs. Grant? Yes, I have. I think you're both very lucky to be going to San Francisco. Mrs. Grant isn't going to San Francisco. Oh, and you're going all the way to the States alone? Not alone. With Mr. Shannon's tour and all these nice people. And you're staying in China? Yes, she is. Uh, yes, I am. Chopin, dear. The well-known brush-off. Interesting and a little mysterious, this Mrs. Grant. And exactly why was she staying in China? I wanted to know a little more about that. Well, easy to move in through the Chinese kid and talk about her new home in San Francisco. In fact, pretty soon I was starting to write down some points of interest back home. Things she must be sure of see. Just close your eyes for a moment before you go in. The temple's very dark. As we walked in, but I didn't remember that until a long time later, I folded that notebook and put it in my right-hand pocket. All I was thinking about at the time was Mrs. Grant, finding it hard to believe that this good-looking gal was mixed up in the narcotics racket. All in all, it had been a very pleasant experience there in the dark, but as we left that room, what I didn't know was that the notebook was no longer in my right-hand pocket. I didn't miss it then, I hadn't missed it yet when Shannon called it a day and the tourists were heading to the hotel. So it didn't seem like anything out of the way that the wheel of my rickshaw was broken and that Shannon should offer to walk me back to the hotel, showing me the way. By the way, something you lost this afternoon. It is yours, isn't it? Yeah, thanks. What did you say your business was again? Rugs, oriental rugs. Funny, now, how did I get the idea you were a census taker? I have no idea. Might be from your habit of writing down names in notebooks. What did you want those names for? Talk fast, mister, who are you? 
Before you get tough, Mr. Shea, listen. You've been in before, this time you'll do five years unless you talk. How about what? The Kiramaru. What's that, a chop so we joined? No, slave ship. I don't know what you're talking about, but I know who you are, and I'm not gonna let you pin a five-year stretch on me. <laughs> See, when Shannon shanghaied you, we shanghaied Shannon. When he resisted, the law might call it murder, except that he was about to murder you. Mr. Sokim tried to warn you about Shannon. We found this belt on Shannon. Unrefined opium, isn't it, sir? Yeah. Did you know he had it on him? Not until after he was dead. But we knew he had it somewhere. How? He called on Mr. Sokim to refine it about an hour before the tour started. What happened? Mr. Sokim told him he was no longer in the business. Then what? Shannon didn't believe him. He said if Mr. Sokim was afraid that this shipment was perfectly safe, straight off a Japanese boat. What boat? He didn't say. Did he say where it was grown? In the Near East. Egypt? He did mention Egypt. Did he say where in Egypt? No, sir. Just Egypt. Grieg had a car waiting, and I asked him to take me to my friends at 25 Peacock Lane. But if you feel all right, I leave you now, Mr. Barrows. Okay, Greg, thank you. Quite I. No, what did you get back? Oi, go down. Hold it. This is the end of an interesting tour, Lum. Get up, Greg. I want to talk to you. Help him up, Joe. Listen to this. I tangled with Shannon this afternoon. It was not cold. Woke up miles away, crossing a stream. Shannon was there, too, only he was dead. Mr. Greg, under Sokim's orders, saved my life. Mr. Sokim did more. He tried to close his case for us. Mr. Grieg said he found that on Shannon. Opium from the Kiramaru, from Egypt. That's what you said, wasn't it, Mr. Grieg? That's what Shannon said. But you heard him say it. Well, did you? Yes. You're a liar. That opium couldn't have come from Egypt. Because poppies can't be harvested until the petals fall. And they fell today. The opium we're looking for is still in Egypt. Shannon got them from the Japanese captain. He got nothing from the Japanese captain. Shannon was just a small-time operator. Sokim told the captain to lead me to the hotel that night. I was supposed to hear him say, Mr. Shannon's room, please. He went upstairs, never went to the room, roamed around the halls and came down. That was to throw me off, pen suspicion on Shannon. And then Mr. Sokim saved my life, threw me some narcotics that could have been Shannon's or anybody's. They certainly weren't from the Kiramaru. Perfect. Except for one little item, Mr. Grieg. Those poppy petals down in Egypt took their own sweet time about falling. And do you know where that refining equipment is you're looking for, Lum? It's somewhere in Mr. Sokim's rickshaw garage, still waiting for that opium from Egypt. An amazing deduction, Commissioner, based on a poppy field that doesn't exist. Within an hour, we were set to raid Sokim's garage, as soon as we could get Mr. Sokim out of the way. Sokim? This is Brent. I called to tell you I was pretty banged up, but your man Grieg was hurt a lot worse than I was. I brought him to some friends of mine, 25 Peacock Lane. I think you better get over as soon as you can. 
Immediately. You'll be right over. Stinson job on. Coming with us, Mr. Barrows? Yes, Captain. By the way, you can leave it to me to clean up the Shannon affair. I'll have all the tourists brought in. The three men who attacked you are suddenly tied up with him. Perhaps they all are. Except Grant, the blonde girl. I don't think she has any connection with Shannon at all. And why not? Because Shannon's tour was leaving Shanghai and the girl is staying. That says she can't be tied up with Shannon. But she could be tied up with Sorkin. Where did you first see her? Not at the hotel, not with the tourists, but at Sorkin's. Now, under orders from Sokim, she joins the tour, just to bring about what happened to you last night. After that, her job is to stay in Shanghai, to wait for those narcotics coming from Egypt. You believe all that, Commissioner? Maybe not. By the way, you said your notebook was taken while you were in the temple. Was the grand girl with you? Yes. And you were writing something in it for the child before you went in. So the blonde lady must have seen it. You just thought. Joe, when Mr. Sorkin arrives, you will know how to entertain him. Well, um, if Ann Grant is half as smart as you're saying, you'll get nothing out of her. I think I can find out exactly why she's staying in Shanghai through the Chinese kid. She trusts me. What are you suggesting? That you just call in Mrs. Grant and leave the kid there. And then instead of going on the raid with you, I'll have a talk with the child. All right, Captain. Very good. Hotel, nice to Ready, take off. Good morning, Francis. Is Mrs. Grant in? She went out. She was very upset. The tour is not sailing to America. Yes, I heard about that. I thought I could help get you to San Francisco some other way. Won't you sit down, Mr. Silkin? I bet you two have known each other a long time. Just a year. Just a year? Oh. Back home in... Uh... Han Yin. She was my governess. Well, no wonder you feel the way you do about her. Everyone did. What do you mean, Princess? I mean, when the bombs fell and so many were killed, so many children without parents and homes that... Here, here. Let's not think about that anymore. What are you reading? Day of Human Beginnings. That's what we call the New Year. No, I should have known about that. Because in San Francisco, the Chinese New Year's a big thing. Do they have the dance of the dragon, too? Sure. Your dragon isn't very fierce, though. Oh, it isn't, huh? I don't imagine it is. No, it's as fierce as yours is. How fierce? Well, it's... Show me. I would if I had something I could use for a dragon. You could use this. Yeah, I... I suppose I could. Well... Don't we have to have coins wrapped up in colored paper for the children? And presents for the grown-ups who aren't married? That means you get one, but Mrs. Grant doesn't because she's married. There uh, is a Mr. Grant, isn't it? He died in Penyon. Oh, that's too bad. I suppose Mr. Grant was a teacher, or a missionary, maybe. No, an engineer. An engineer? He worked near Penyon. And that's where they met? Oh, no, they were married in America. Oh. Well, there are your coins. Happy New Year. Kunin now. Happy New Year. Kunin, uh, Happy New Year. Well, here I go. New Year. That's a San Francisco dragon. Is that what it is? Chopin, would you run down to the desk and see if there's any mail, please? Yes, of course. What are you doing here? 
Weren't you called at the station about Shannon? Yes, I was. But they sent me back for my papers. Well, I was called, too. They couldn't hold me because I wasn't booked with the tour. They're holding both of us for questioning. They are, huh? I don't mind about myself. But we can't take Shu Pan into that police station. And they can't keep her in Shanghai. Well, I have a little influence here. I'll see what I can do. I'm a lot more grateful than I can tell you, Mr. Brent. I was pretty rude yesterday. Look, uh, suppose I could clear you both. How about two tickets on the Clipper, one for you? That's very kind, but I'm not going to America. I'd just love to take the kid back. After that, naturally, you'd want to go home. America is my home. Oh? I married an American and lived there for many years. Well, if America really is your home, why not go back? You've been gone quite a while. It's out of the question. It isn't a matter of money for the trip. You just want to stay in China. That's right. Well, I guess you have your reasons. They must be pretty important. You give that a very peculiar tone, Mr. Brent. Sorry. I guess I'd better see what I can do about Chu Pan's release. I really am sorry. And I am very grateful. Look, uh, we might get together after Chu Pan leaves. That is, if you're going to stay in Shanghai. Perhaps a week or so. I'll be very busy shopping. I love to shop. Look, I've got to get back. What are you going to shop for, clothes? Yes, clothes. And farm tools and seed. And all the canned food I can find in Shanghai. Playing governess to the whole of Pan Yen. The children of this country have a right to live and believe in the future. You're kind of young and healthy to bury yourself in Pan Yen. What else did Shu Pan tell you? Something about my husband, perhaps? I believe she did mention it, yes. He was killed by Japanese bombs while doing a job for China. I intend to stay here and finish that job the best way I can. What could you teach those Chinese kids about a future when you haven't got the courage to make one for yourself? It takes courage to pick up the pieces and start to live again. Why not go back home, tell America about China, raise barrels of money for millions of shoe pans? Is that all? Or maybe there's something you don't want to talk about. What makes you think so? Because if shoe pan means to you what you say she does, after a point, she doesn't. The sooner she... Chopin. I didn't mean that, dear. Of course she didn't, Princess. Yes? It's rather important that you come to Sokim's garage, Mr. Brent. That is, if you have finished. I'll be right over. It's the people who sent for you. While I'm there, I'll try to make those arrangements. Everything's going to be all right, Princess. Come in, Mr. Barrows. Take a look. Mr. Sorkim's refining equipment. Hello? Just a moment. Good morning, gentlemen. Will you join me? No, thank you. You're missing something. I had this specially prepared. Will you talk now, Mr. Sorkin? Very clever of you, Mr. Barrows. The poppy petals, I mean. I overlooked that little fact. But you did know about it. And the location of the field in Egypt, you know that too. Yes. But Mr. Greek doesn't. Nor the captain of the Kiramaru. Gentlemen, your case ends here. Don't be too sure. Oh, I'm very... I'm very sure. Get the doctor. Much too late, Commissioner. I've been eating for some time. Your American friend is puzzled. Explain to him what happens when bamboo slivers are rolled up in food. Poke into your gut. Like glass. 
Where is the field? What made you do it? Fear of Jean Hawks? Who is Jean Hawks? Don't be a child. We should never have moved in on So Kim. We should have waited until all the stuff from Egypt was in that garage. I'm afraid we had to move in. Once you knocked Mr. Greek down, there was little else we could do. That's right. If we'd held him, or if we'd let him go, Sokim had to know within an hour. I made a bad mistake, eh? Oh, in my time, I've made a few myself, Commissioner. Death by bamboo slivers. Cruel method, isn't it? The act of a fanatic. A fanatic who was also afraid. But afraid of what? Enough to kill himself. Well, what else do we know? Those of us in narcotics here are certain that for years there has been an organization here in China operating in drugs, organized by the Japanese government and paid by them. When I was in Manchuria in 1931, I saw there such an organization spreading narcotics to the people. Why? Drugs eat away their will to resist, making conquest that much easier. An excellent military strategy, isn't it? The people in this organization, not all Japanese by any means. No, these are citizens of every nation in the world. Fanatical Sokims who believe in conquest and degenerates who can be bought to do this filthy work for the Japanese high command. That is Jean Hawke's commissioner, which explains Sokim's death. The price for failure, an organization that perhaps reaches around the world with collaborators even in Egypt, which explains how a poppy field can be so wonderfully hidden and a hundred Chinese taken across the Atlantic. That makes sense, Lam. If so, then we also know this. Sokim's suicide has warned them. They'll change their plans. Those narcotics will never come here for refining. Nothing much we can do to stop it now. Unless they come on some trace of the field in Egypt. I'm sending Sokim's papers to Cairo immediately. Commissioner Hadley may find something in them that ties in with what he knows there. A bare possibility. Can you get them there in time? The poppy petals fell yesterday. If we say five days to harvest, that leaves three days after today. The papers can be flown to Cairo in two days and nights in one of our Air Force planes. Leaving just one day after they get there. Not much time, huh? Mm. That's why I thought if someone from here were to go with them, someone who has had your experiences and mine on this case, too strenuous a trip for me, I'm afraid. I hoped you would go, Commissioner. I don't see how I can, Lum. I know it was my blunder that finished this job here, but it's finished. I can't take it on myself to go to Egypt. Not on a bare possibility. I'm sorry. So am I. As a matter of fact, I should be making some sort of arrangements about going home. I, I think I better go back to the hotel now and see what I can do about it. Before I leave, I'll, I'll see that you get a report on my talk with Mrs. Grant. I'll appreciate it. Hello. I've got the report for you, Lum. Thank you. You made your arrangements, I see. Yes, I have uh, reservations on the Clipper tonight. Come in. Here, you might look this over while I pack. Oh, I'm sorry. That's all right. Mr. Lum Chi Chow and Joe, Mrs. Grant. How do you do, Mrs. Grant? How do you do? I had something important to tell you. Certainly. Well, oh, that's all right. I'll just be a minute. I've changed my mind, Mr. Brent. I am going back to the States with Chopin. Before I try to get reservations, I'd like to know if you can get releases for both of us. I'll see what I can do. Should be able to let you know in an hour. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Definitely staying in China. We agreed that after Sir Kim's death, there would be a change of plans. Except that what I said to her this morning may have made the difference. It's all in the report. 
There are some things your report may not contain, Commissioner. I have Mrs. Grant's passport, which the police are holding. An American passport. Yes, she was married to an American. You'll find that covered, too. But not this, perhaps. She did not arrive here directly from America. For a year and a half before coming to China, she was in Egypt. The visas and dates leave no doubt of it. They ought to be checking up on Mrs. Grant from Egypt right away. I sent a cable to Cairo an hour ago. This release she wants, why not? If she's tied up in this, why not let her go and follow her? She'll be watched from the minute she gets to San Francisco. I agree. Of course, digging up something in Egypt is the main hope. And someone who had known her might be an enormous help there. Lum, I told you, any decision on my going to Egypt would have to be made by my boss, Anslinger. As to that, Commissioner, he's quite willing to have you go. Mr. Anslinger and I have been in communication. I saw Kim's papers, and I thought you could use the sun helmet for Egypt. Farther and farther from my rose garden in San Francisco, doing myself some good, as Anslinger had said, which is what I wrote him about. If he meant getting educated at a rate that was making me dizzy, I hoped he was the same. Regards. And on the last day left for the harvesting of those poppies, if our timetable was correct, Cairo, where I was met by the Egyptian Commissioner of Narcotics, Amr Hassam, and the British Narcotics Commissioner, Lionel Hadley. And all I'd brought for them was a Shanghai experience and a lot of reading matter, that box full of So Kim's papers. We hurried from the airfield to Narcotics Headquarters in Cairo. Not a trace yet of that poppy field, and only hours left of this last day. Laboratory men went right to work on So Kim's papers. Hadley explained to me that the only thing they were fairly certain of was what direction those narcotics would take leaving Egypt. You see this shaded area here? We call it Area S, meaning suspected area. We say that either it's here or we can never hope to find it. Because this cross is the point where the slave whose voice you've heard on the record swam ashore. The rest of the slaves must have landed nearby and at night. Now, where could they have been taken in one night's march without being seen? No further than to some point within this area. If so, the most logical way out of Egypt of those narcotics would be across the Suez Canal. And the nearest crossing of the canal is here. Your real hope is the Suez crossing. Exactly. And in the last four days there? We haven't caught anything. Unfortunately, there are a few tricks we still have to learn about. And your only chance is the last of the harvest when it goes through tonight. Pretty slim one if they've been succeeding for four days. Here's the report on Anne Grant, Commissioner. She and her husband, Jerome Grant, entered Egypt at Alexandria September 20th, 1933. Stopped at Windsor Hotel four weeks. Moved on from there October 15th to Cairo. Stayed at Shepherd's Hotel approximately eight weeks, then left on tour. No record of them for more than ten months. No forwarding addresses. They just dropped out of sight. Commissioner, Professor Salim found something you should see. These seven letters from a Mr. William Adams. No address given. Business letters referring to a consignment of goods to one of So Kim's enterprises. What about them? The handwriting? Yes, Arabic. Looks like plain English to me. I mean, the man who wrote them first learned to write in Arabic. I know, because I did too. We examined the paper itself. It was made in France. Well, then Mr. William Adams could hardly have written from Egypt. French-made paper isn't sold here. It is sold in the French mandates, in Syria, Hadley, and in Lebanon, so that William Adams could be a wealthy Lebanite. Mahmoud? Yes, sir. Get out all the film we have on the Lebanese estates. Yes, sir. You see, Barrows? Your reading matter came in useful. Well, that's fine, but I thought the field was in Egypt. It is. Where does Lebanon come in? Lebanites. We have hundreds of Lebanites with estates in Egypt, especially in Area S. Estate of Ali Yusuf. Ten miles northwest from Bir Tawahe. Ten acres of roses grown for perfume. What kind of rose is that? Rosa Sancta, probably. That's the rose the pharaohs grew. You a rose fancier, Barrows? I certainly am. In fact, I'd like to get a cutting of that Rosa Sancta to take back home with me. The estate of Suleiman Jafar Pasha. All in maize, 20 miles south of the landing place. 
Look like maize to you, Barrel. Yes, it does. A state of Tufik Ahmed Pasha, growing mostly cotton. Here we are in the uplands, Barrel. How'll they get the water up there? It's piped over from the Nile, and then drawn up by pumps. That's a bit of engineering. How did the pharaohs do it? Well, the water was carried up by slaves. A state of Binda Shah, on the north edge of the Baidea Plateau. 30 acres and roses for perfume. Artificial irrigation again. Yes, a very modern job was done up there about two years ago. A state of Hassan Ali, 25 acres of cotton. Ama, you wouldn't remember that engineer's name. What engineer? Who did the job at Ben Shah's. No. He wasn't American, was he? I have no idea. Well, that's that. I don't know what we expected to find. We've been over that film a dozen times. Cheer up, Barrows. Perhaps what we all need is a drink. Good idea, Adler. How far is this estate of Ben the Shah's? About three hours by car. Why? I'd like to borrow a car and go after a specimen of that rose. Ben the Shah would never let you in. Well, it's strictly against Muslim law for men to enter. Some of those places we had to photograph from the air. Why couldn't I climb one of these cliffs? Are you serious? Why not? Even if you didn't break your neck getting up there, the servants would break it for you when you got to the top. It'll be dark when I get there. Three hours by car to the cliffs behind Ben Deshaw's estate. And nothing could dissuade Amar and Hadley from making that climb with me. They knew it was more than a rose I was after, and these were the last desperate minutes of the last day. They were ready to follow even this wild hunch of mine. A hunch about an engineering job, possibly done by a man named Grant. is all right. could have sent for them. Would he have a foreign governess? Well, lots of these fellows do. Anne Grant had been a governess in Pan Yin. Just another hunch. Just one more coincidence. Let's get back to the cliff. I had to take a look at that irrigated soil. My hunch was leaping around like mad now. And then all of a sudden, the almost unbelievable answer. A battered stem that had been hoed under just a little while ago. Not a rose stem, but a stubby one with a swollen pod at the end that could have been grown under the roses and never been seen from a plane. Stem of the opium poppy. them under the rose bushes. Now we know exactly where it's coming from. And how it might be going through. In perfume jars or cartons of rose petals. I should be at the Suez crossing. Tell my men what to look for. Suppose the last of the harvest is still up there. While he goes to the crossing, I'm going back in there to find out. I'll go with you. I should be at the Suez crossing in half an hour. I'll send some men right back here to watch for you. They'll be waiting on the beach. Good idea. Better take this. You better take these. Good luck. See you at the Suez. We inched our way back over Ben Shah's estate taking us more than an hour. Near the barns, we came on the last of a fire of what looked like leaves and twigs. Actually, it was the fire that burned the evidence, the poppy stems that had been gathered after the harvest. Finally, the barn that held the entire secret. All that was left of the 200 slaves brought to Egypt six months ago on the Kiramaru. 
and it was a toss-up whether these were any luckier than the hundred I'd seen drowned. There were the hands that had harvested the poppies. You could tell that from the stained index finger. That's how the harvesting is done. First with these little knives, making a slit in the pod. A gummy substance oozes out, and this is what the index finger scoops up. After that, scraping it off the finger into these little harvesting cups. From those cups into a vat of boiling water where leaves and twigs and other foreign matter float to the surface and are skimmed off. This fire died just a few hours ago. The amber liquid had cooled into a hard, tar-like substance, which was then pounded with these mallets into a million little pieces. Looks like the stuff is gone, Hadley. I think you're right, Barrows. They're sweating. They made a trip tonight. You mean this other stuff got down? Possibly. Not all the way to the Suez crossing. Probably just down to the edge of the desert and then picked up by car or camels. May I ask what you are doing here? Bindashar? Yes, Lewa. We've been learning about the harvesting of the opium poppy. Only roses are harvested here, and the petals are still for perfume. You mean you didn't know that poppies were growing under your roses? Are you certain? Come over here. What's this? A poppy stem. And you are welcome to it, Liwa. Because the opium from those poppies left here an hour ago. For the Suez crossing. Isn't that so? And after the Suez crossing, where was it going? To Al Huna. Murder won't help you after this. Right now, your estate is surrounded by our men. You are lying, Lewa. Give me your light. The best thing you can do is to tell us where those narcotics are going. I've completely forgotten. You're coming with us. Order your men to put down their guns. Atufka ala arg. Now send them back to their quarters. Ah! A second fanatic, like So Kim, paying with his life for failure and taking all information with him. Hadley and I headed at once for the Suez Gate, through which those narcotics had to come. Amar was on the job, searching carefully and quietly. The point was not to take that opium, but to be able to follow it. The first thing I did was to send a cable to my assistant in San Francisco, orders to watch Ann Grant from the moment she arrived, and to keep me advised of every move she made. During the next few hours, nothing, and Amar still quietly on the job. In its raw form, the narcotics would be of considerable bulk. But even if they broke it up into small parcels, we stood a good chance to come on some trace of it. Camel driver going to Beirut and French Lebanon. He'd taken another herd there three days ago. Three days ago? That's a long trip. Well, that's the point. The only way he could have made it was to move with his camels day and night, and then race back here by car. What did he say? Said he was taking them to a Beirut slaughterhouse. They needed camels there and had just raised their price for them. Was he carrying anything? Not a thing. Searched him and everything on his camels. Not a thing. It was nearly dawn and nothing yet when Amar's men arrived from Ben Dashar's, where they'd stayed to search for anything that seemed important. Ben Dashar's private papers yielded nothing. But out of the pump house came an interesting item. 
an engineer's logbook. Recognize her barrels? Mrs. Grant herself. I could have been asking her the right questions in Shanghai. There's a lot I'd like to say to her now. You remember that camel driver? He was lying. I got in touch with Beirut. No slaughterhouse there is paying more for camels. But you searched him. He wasn't carrying anything. No, he wasn't. Still, all we have to show for the night is a camel driver who lied. That's right. Come on, you know about camels. Tell us things. What things? What do they sell them for? The hair and hide. The hair for brushes and clothes. But what about the camel himself? Well, I could give you the textbook recital. The camel, a prehistoric animal with a miserable disposition, has four stomachs, sleeps with its legs folded under it. Its lifespan is about... Just a minute. Suppose we catch up with that camel herd and check on Amar's facts. If Barrows can have a hunch, so can I. Within an hour, we were headed for the port of Beirut, the first step in Hadley's plan of action. He had phoned ahead to the Commissioner of Narcotics in French Lebanon, Larissier, who met us at the airport. According to instructions, there were two cars waiting, one of them a light truck, which carried certain equipment Hadley had asked for. We headed back in the direction from which we had come, taking the caravan trail for the purpose of intercepting that camel driver timing our ride of more than 200 miles to come on him late that night. We figured that camel driver would be traveling fast, and it was likely he would make camp that night at the oasis of Biracini. That's what we counted on. had to get there late when he was certain to be asleep. It was after midnight when we arrived, and we saw the herd crouched around the fire. We stopped a safe distance off. Out of the truck came the equipment. It was a portable fluoroscope. Whenever I see one today, I call it Hadley's inspiration. Everything depended on that camel driver never knowing we'd paid him a visit. If he should awake, they were instructed to knock him out to make it seem like he'd been attacked and robbed. The business now was to unhobble those camels and lead them one by one to our truck. Our fluoroscope was ready. And there, in the stomach of the camel, metal cartridges containing that raw opium from Ben Deshaw's poppies. Small enough to be forced down a camel's throat and remain in his first stomach until they could be removed at the slaughterhouse. An estimated $100,000 worth of unrefined narcotics in each camel. A million dollars worth, all told, in the 10 beasts in this herd. Four times that much, we estimated, had gone through in the same way to someone in Beirut. And when the last camel was led back and hobbled, our job was to get away just as we'd come, because we wanted to know who that someone in Beirut was. And for the next 40 hours, all the way there, that caravan was never out of sight of Larissier's men. On the second day, he arrived there. And then we knew that the next link in the Gene Hawks chain was the slaughterhouse owned by a man named Agassiz. It was late that afternoon that a truck left the slaughterhouse with three bales on it, addressed for shipment, and headed for the docks. The first bale was unloaded at a Mediterranean freighter and addressed to a Mr. L. Lexitote. Athens, Greece. The second was put aboard a French line freighter headed for Marseille, going to a man named Dolier. The third one boarded a Dutch freighter addressed to N. Vranstad, Havana, Cuba. We were fairly sure that a million dollars worth of narcotics was in one of those three bales. We were certain of it when Agassiz left his slaughterhouse that same day for Damascus. His job was finished. And now Lorissier picked three men to follow each of those bales to the country to which it was going. This was the trail to the Gene Hawks ring, the first solid clue in all these months. And that was something worth celebrating. But I'd have been a lot less relaxed during that dinner if I'd known what still lay ahead of me. Well, here's to our rose fans here. To you, Lewa. Lewa. Thanks, boys. 
But would someone tell me exactly what that Liwa means? A word of respect. It means man of great importance. I'm afraid you've got the wrong man. If we would really do him honor, there is the word Bashar, meaning man belonging to mankind. A few weeks ago, I started looking for something. Narcotics. What I found were some men. Two in China. Lum Chi and Joe. They belong to mankind. Then on the other side of the world, an Egyptian, an Englishman, a Frenchman. They'd all learn to speak as one. It's a happy thought that when we say mankind, we also mean womankind. Yes, I found something in that line, too, in Shanghai. Hadley, you have the photograph I ask you to keep for me. Show it to the boys. Thank you. A lady named Anne Graff. Looks intelligent. Very intelligent. Knew they were poppies growing at Ben Shah's. Much too intelligent to mention it. The governess. Well, Horatio, that man you're sending to Havana, I wonder if you'd mind holding him. That's on my way home. I'd like to follow that bail myself. Another hunch, Barrows? No, information this time. Anne Grant left San Francisco a few hours after arrival. Destination Havana. I was on a steamer the next night, bound for Cuba, passing that Dutch freighter the next day. I'd be there long ahead of her. We had cabled the Cuban narcotics commissioner I was coming and that I wanted to get into Havana unnoticed. This is what he cabled back. Tell your friend on arrival to hire finest cab available. We'll make his stay more pleasant. Alberto Barado. Cab, senor. Six American dollars for the day. Six dollars. Nice cab, senor. Six American dollars a day. Eight dollars. Car for hire. Eight American dollars for the day. A little expensive, aren't you? Finest cab available, senor. We'll make your stay more pleasant. You got a deal. You come from Europe, senor? No, the Near East. Oh, I have a relative out there. Very prominent man. Maybe you know him. Well, it's a big place. What's his name? Larissier. Oh, yes, I know him. Relative, huh? My brother. <laughs> you don't look much like him. Different fathers. Oh, the different name, huh? Verado. Well, it's all very simple, Verado. There should be a lady named Anne Grant here in Havana. I'd like to know where she is, what she does, and whom she sees. So far, simple enough. One person she will be seeing, I think, is a fellow named Vranstadter. Know him? Uh, yes, a manufacturer of artist supplies, uh, brushes, things of that kind. Getting his camel hair from the Near East. Several shipments a year, probably. Probably. Uh, um, sugar? Thank you. Then just another bale of camel hair arriving in a few days. Wouldn't have much trouble getting through customs. Oh, a hole punched in the side, a finger poked around, no more. And anything buried in the middle of that bale would go through all right. Mm -hmm. Like, say, a million dollars worth of unrefined narcotics? It's as simple as that. Now, you could go down to customs and just pick it up. But no. Because four times that much is in Vranstetter's now. You wouldn't want to tip him off and lose that. So you let it go through. Now it's all there. Easy to get now. But not yet. You wait and let him refine it. Now he's ready to ship it out with his artist supplies. You let him do that. Watch where it's going and follow it. Or rather, I do, after thanking you for your help and hospitality. Five million dollars worth of narcotics inside Cuba's borders. And all I do, I help them refine it and ship it away. A lot to ask, huh? Quite a lot. Commissioner, I think I'm going to have to take you on a world tour. An hour later, my friend Barado was on the job. In fact, that same night, he arranged a change of quarters for me to a small hotel on Concordia Street, commanding a view of an interesting building, the place of business of N. Vranstadter. And a certain lady was in Havana. And a surprise, a man named Chen Su, who had arrived two days ago from South America, known as Chupin's uncle. And it was none other than Mr. N. Vranstadter who was showing them the city. 
A pleasant little party with nothing to do until a certain Dutch freighter arrived from the Near East, which was two days later. And the progress of that bail through customs was exactly as Barado had predicted. A finger poked around inside, no more. And a few hours later, night work for the first time in Randstadter's place. The refining of those raw narcotics to become the deadly powder, one-tenth its former weight in bulk and ten times easier to ship. When that light goes out, senor, I will be a slightly nervous man. So will I, my friend. From that minute on, Barado's men were stationed around Randstadter's, watching for anything that might leave the place and ready to follow it. And now they watched all cargo manifests for whatever might be shipped by Randstadter, checking the bills of lading of all boats in port or about to arrive. And at the same time, a routine checkup of all passenger lists, just in case. And out of that checkup, suddenly came a bombshell. Randstadter, Ann Grant, Chupin, Chan Su had booked passage on the SS Cardillo for New York. She steamed into Havana that afternoon a cargo ship of about 10,000 tons, carrying 100 passengers. Sailing at noon the next day for New York, my own backyard. We went back and checked her cargo manifest again. Still nothing listed from Brandstetter. And by nighttime, Verado and I were a couple of pretty troubled men. This means there will be no shipments like there were from Beirut. Brandstetter is taking it there himself. And to New York. New York. And he expects to smuggle it through our customs which means he must have a plan to do it. It's hopeless, senor. Why? You want to follow these narcotics. To do this now, you must know how they are taken aboard, where they hide them. Of course, I've got to know that. Then you would have to search every piece of cargo, every passenger, his personal baggage. The minute you do this, Franz Stadter will know why you are doing it. And that will be the end of his feeling of safety and the end of everything you are trying to do. I know, and he can get it on board a thousand ways. His people may be passengers, members of the crew. And we may lose it all. At least, the risk is fantastic. Well, what's the answer, Barato? To take the narcotics tonight while they're still over there. You mean give up? And right across the water is the rest of this outfit. Maybe the top of the whole heap. On the other hand, senor, I am responsible for five million dollars worth of narcotics that are now inside Cuba's borders. There's no such thing as borders, Barato. Not while this ring operates in the whole world. No one country has licked its problem until every country has. Three men in Beirut took a big risk. That's how you found out there was a criminal in Cuba by the name of Randstetter. That was a brave speech, but Verado was still right. We decided to wait a little longer. We might still see it leave in a suitcase or package that we could follow on board. A desperate chance and a desperate night of waiting. Not until 8 o'clock in the morning, a small ray of hope. Last minute cargo for the Cardillo from Brandstatter. Artist supplies to a Henry Scharf, Maiden Lane, New York. And that's what they loaded on the truck an hour later, three hours before sailing time. A ray of hope, but actually it made no sense. There wasn't a chance the stuff was in those packages. Brand Stata was smart enough to know he hadn't a prayer of getting that amount of narcotics through New York customs that way. Those boxes would be picked clean in a routine checkup in New York Harbor in five minutes flat. He had to know that. It must be as Barato said. Brand Stata was taking it there himself. If so, why this cargo, and why had he waited so long to declare it? Just a few hours before sailing. Probably meant nothing. But so far, that was all we had to go on. The fellow in the warehouse lookout reported the obvious. The packages had been turned over to customs. Well, Barado's men would have to follow it on board and see where it was stowed, then travel with it to New York. But we felt in our bones this wasn't the answer. It was too late to do anything now, but let Brandstatter get it on board his own way, and we'd have to take our chances. The big risk agreed to by Barado. A very remarkable little fight. And right then, a couple of foolhardy men got lucky. It was just an ordinary incident, a stalled motor. 
so ordinary it might have been missed if the fellow in the lookout hadn't been extra curious. While one of those men worked on the motor, the other was tearing the wrappings off some other packages in the back of the truck. The truck had stalled right near the kitchen supplies for the Cardillo, specifically the cartons of butter waiting to go on board. And with the wrappings off, that's what Randstad's packages were, cartons of butter, exactly like the others. But obviously, Randstadter wasn't shipping butter. Within a half hour, we were at the dock. And minutes later, those food stores were going aboard. No mystery now why Randstadter had waited that late to bring his cargo to the dock. That butter couldn't stand in the warehouse as much as an hour because it was perishable. So Randstadter had to wait until exactly the right time. And obviously, he had to have someone on board the Cardillo who knew the schedule. That butter would move from the deck into the galley, and naturally would go into the refrigerator. And that's where Vranstadter's man, or men, would have to be when those cartons arrive. A big responsibility for that man because three of those cartons held $5 million worth of narcotics, and his job was to be able to tell which ones they were. There had to be markings of some kind by which he could do it, separating the vital three from the others, and guaranteeing that during the voyage, those three wouldn't be touched. An hour before sailing, and our friends were coming aboard. The meaning of those three cartons, and what would happen to them as we entered New York Harbor, that was Randstadter's secret. And that's what I had to find out by the time we got there. like I was on my way home. According to plan, there would be a vacant cabin on deck C, cabin C-22. And the man waiting for me there would be the steward of this corridor, Verado's man. Fernando? Yes, Commissioner. Better know you. An hour later in the galley, Hernando had his night watch on the job. It was the night baker, an old friend of his. Not a narcotics agent, but a fighter for decent causes from way back. And by morning, Hernando had his day shift organized. One of these men was the ship's butcher. The other was an assistant chef. From here to New York, that refrigerator would be watched around the clock. And that same morning, Hernando had the ship's chart for me, all marked. On deck C, the ship's kitchen, and the refrigerator. Here I was, and she and Sue here. The cabin next to me, and the outside one across from me, also vacant. On deck B, Vranstadter's cabin, and the one shared by Ann Grant and Chupin. As for Mr. Vranstadter, reports said he was quite socialized. By lunchtime, he'd made the acquaintance of half the passengers, perhaps checking on them. But he couldn't imagine that he was anything but completely safe. At mid-afternoon of that first day, I sent a message in code to Anslinger. Everything was under control. Ask him to send some of our men aboard with the pilot in New York Harbor. Yes, Senor Franstata. There are a few empty cabins in this corridor. So the purser said, anyone will do so long as the plumbing works. I do insist on plumbing that works. That one is an inside cabin, senor. The outside ones are here. Oh? Still, that one is empty, too. It should not be locked. I can get the key from the purser if you care to see it. This one will do very well. If you see that my baggage is brought, please. I checked your story, senor. The plumbing was really out of order. If it was deliberately tempered with, it was very skillfully done. Thanks, Hernando. Good night. Why didn't he take one of those vacant cabins on his deck? 
because the only outside cabin left was down here? Possible. But more likely, he had tampered with that plumbing in order to check every vacant cabin on board. Well, if so, now he knew this vacant cabin was locked. The next thing he'd have to know was why. I beg your pardon. How stupid. They gave me the wrong key and I simply went to the number like a sheep. I'm very sorry. I don't believe we've met. I came aboard ill. Very sorry to hear it. Please forgive me. Score for Mr. Vransatter. Cabin 22, marked vacant, was not vacant. And no occupant for C-22 on the passenger list. The list printed on board after the ship is at sea. And now he'd never stop until he knew exactly who that unlisted passenger in C-22 was. A good chance I was a narcotics agent. An outside chance I'd been on this trail since China. That's where Mrs. Grant had been, too. A million to one shot, she'd seen me there and would know who I was. A chance this skillful maniac would never overlook. Sooner or later, he had to bring Mrs. Grant to see me. No move by Vranstadter the rest of that night. Morning of the second day at sea, traveling along the coast of Florida, halfway home. And in the galley, nothing but cartons of butter had come out of that refrigerator. The narcotics were still in there. Vranstadter had to bring Mrs. Grant, just a matter of time, and he was taking plenty of it. Why not? Where could I go? It was near the end of the second day at sea, off Cape Hatteras now, just 24 hours out of New York Harbor. And that second day was the longest day I'd ever lived. It was the last night of the voyage. There'd be a sort of captain's dinner tonight. I could hear the orchestra, all very gay and friendly. And I had a feeling that Randstadter would make his move tonight. What more perfect time, by a man of finesse, for a visit to a poor shut-in in cabin 22. Come in. Good evening. We brought you a little cheer from the captain's table. And may I present... Uh... Hello, Mrs. Grant. You know each other? Yes. What well, what a charming coincidence. We met in Shanghai, Mr... Frontstadter. You seem to be feeling much better tonight. Yeah, it's much better. I'll be up and around tomorrow. Good. Then we'll spend the last day on board together. I really should be going back to the party. Why don't you stay a while, Mrs. Grant? I'm sure you'll have a lot to talk about. Good night, Mr. Brent. See you in the morning. I'm sorry you've been ill. A touch of fever. It gets me down now and then. I picked it up in Egypt. Oh, that's where you went from Shanghai. I thought you went to San Francisco. We did get there, but Chopin's uncle had gone to Havana on business. He insisted we meet him there. And this Vranstadter, ship's acquaintance? A business friend of Chopin's uncle. He was very kind to us in Havana. Charming fellow, isn't he? You're looking well, Mrs. Grant. I feel wonderful. That's good. I'm glad we met again. We were bound to in San Francisco, weren't we? I wanted to thank you for something. Yes? Yeah? The things you said to me that morning in the hotel. Oh, yes, yes, I remember. About picking up the pieces and starting to live again. Yes. So whatever happens I have in the future, I owe to a conversation in Shanghai. Well, it's those little accidents in life that make all the difference. I don't want to keep you from your party. Could you join us? Not tonight, tomorrow. We'll have a big day tomorrow. Suppose we meet in the lounge at 10. We'll both show up together. All right. Good night. Good night. Doubly careful watch in the galley. From now until New York late tomorrow. Morning. Mrs. Grant and I met at exactly the time arranged, and I was starting the most important day since I left San Francisco. And as the morning wore on, a friendly little group, chatting away, carefree and happy. And at lunchtime, still inseparable, Chupin gave me the sketch to keep. The artist had said there were lines of suffering in that face. There'd be a few more when she found out they'd palmed off a phony blood relation on her. 
And from the galley, no move to touch those cartons. And nothing reported by mid-afternoon, less than three hours from New York. And up in the lounge, warm friends by this time, and reading each other's minds like open books. But nothing was worrying Vranstadter or Anne Grant. The passing of time, the closest to New York. Like they didn't know the name was Barrows, not Brent. Like it wasn't up to them to make a move in that galley within a couple of hours. I couldn't understand it. Close to five now. Less than an hour to picking up the pilot in New York Harbor. What if those three cartons down there were just decoys? What if Vranstadter had known who I was long before I got to Havana and had set me on this false trail while he got the narcotics on board some other way? This panic of mine was growing every minute. We'll be taking on the harbor pilot soon. Maybe we should break this up. Oh, not yet. We have plenty of time. Another glass, Mr. Brent. To our continued friendship. smoke there was a grease fire in the galley nothing to worry about grease fire that's not uncommon aboard ship incidentally i know some excellent place to eat why don't we all have dinner tonight ashore oh could you yes princess i think i could look we'll be docking in about an hour i have a lot of things to do i haven't started to pack then we'd better go hmm? I have very little packing to do. I'll see the ladies to their cabin. Thank you. Look at the gulls. They follow the ship in waiting for garbage. Let's go and watch. There was a fire in the galley. I know. Anything happened to the boxes? They are empty. It was taken out during the fire. Well, where did it go? What about our men down there? There was so much smoke they could not see. Fernando, you go back to the galley. I'm going to see what happened to our friends. Stowing gear in it. Careless of them, wasn't it? I'm sorry, sir. You better rest a while, Miss Brent. I'll be all right, Doctor. Thank you very much. Very kind of you. How do you feel? I wouldn't worry that much about it, Mrs. Grant. Are you all right, Senor? That's nothing, Hernando. Just a little accident. What time is it? 5.20. The pilot comes aboard in a few minutes. Well, then, Mrs. Grant, you better get back to your packing. I have time. 
Can't I help you? No, thank you. I can manage. Hernando will give me a hand. I'll see you later. All right. Just as I was going back on deck. An accident? No, I wasn't wanted up there. Why? What about the galley? No trace of it. You say the pilot's coming aboard, huh? And the men from the bureau. Oh, fine. I got a lot to tell them. The stage to fire and the stuff is gone. The lady dropped a rose petal. It's a lovely touch, isn't it? Well, let me think. 5.20. I left her in the lounge 20 minutes ago and she was going to pack. How did she get down here? How did she hear about it? I heard it when I started back from the galley. It was suddenly all over the ship. That it was me? Somebody said the American who came on board ill. No, the American. I came on. Fernando, look. These are finger marks, aren't they? Yes. It looks like grease. Grease? She was undoing my collar. With grease on her fingers, she couldn't have been packing. Maybe she never got back to her cabin. This rose was healthy enough about 20 minutes ago up in the lounge. She couldn't have been here for over five minutes. Where was she the other 15 minutes before that? Hernando, I'm going back up on deck. You meet the men when they come aboard. Send one to watch Branstadter's cabin and the Chinese uncles. Tell the rest to go to the galley. Close the place off and start searching the crew's quarters. Bunks, lockers, tear the place apart. I'll be down the galley myself in 10 minutes. Anything in here? Went through the stove, bins, not a thing. What about the cruise quarters? Got three men down there, nothing yet. Let's take a look in here. That's right. This is how it came aboard. We saw it come on. And this is how they told which was which. Look, check mark. It's on all of them. But not on that one, and I bet it wasn't on any of the others. They staged a fire to get it out of here. Three of this crew are working for us. Did Hernando tell you who they were? Tonight, Baker here and these two men. But you're an assistant cook. Well, it needed two or three men to pull that job, Clark. And they're still right here in this crew. Except that we haven't time to find them. Where did they dump the garbage? Out there. What do you mean, out there? Over the side? No, at the stern. Oh, at the stern. They take it way back there, huh? Why do you ask? I'm just trying to pin something down. Show me. Yes, sir. Come along, Clark. What time was that garbage dumped? Exactly what time? Was it before the fire or after the fire? Somebody ought to know that. It was before. You sure? Yes. Before the fire, huh? No, I don't think so. No te metas lo que no te importa. Ya no me levante la voz, eh? Grease fire, huh? Where did it start? Back here by the stove? Right there. Right there, huh? Ran down this way, maybe? Yes, sir. Down between the cans. That's right, sir. The fire didn't get over there, huh? No. Nope. Look, Clark. The fire started back there, but the stove came down between these two cans. Look at them. That can is scorched. The other one isn't. 
There's the other scorched can over there. Which means the garbage was dumped after the fire and the cans didn't get back to the same places. And he says it was before the fire. He's lying and he knows he's lying. Why? I'm not sure, but I've got a hunch. It's a while, Luna, and I have only a little time to prove it. Wait here for me. I couldn't find you. I was afraid. Afraid? You had just disappeared. I ran down to your cabin, and then I went all over the ship looking for you. Now, isn't that funny? I was just going to call you and ask you to do something for me. It's kind of a secret. I'll put it to you this way. Do you think Anne likes me a little? Well, I like her a lot. But here's the point. I just received a radiogram. I won't be able to have dinner with you tonight. I have to catch the first plane for Chicago. Maybe weeks before we see each other again in San Francisco. So would you wait here while I talk with Anne alone for just 10 minutes? Yes, Mr. Brent. That's a good girl. Oh, uh, Mr. Brand said I wanted a business address. I won't have time to see him, so I wrote it down. While I'm with Anne, will you take this to his cabin? Yes. And don't forget, come right back here and wait for me. Come in. Hello. Hello. Got a little bad news. Party's off tonight. I'm flying right out. Oh, that's a shame. Yes, isn't it? So many things I wanted to ask you. Well, we'll all meet in San Francisco. No, but not for a month or so. Some of this can't wait. Go ahead and pack. You've got a late start. We'll just talk a little about your past life. Oh, and your husband. Tell me about him. Just like that? Yeah, it shouldn't be too unpleasant. Quite a love story, wasn't it? Or maybe it wasn't. Not the last year of it, no. Really? You were full of his memory in Shanghai. You were going to stay in China to finish his work. His work was something else. Oh, you approved of that, huh? Well, let's work then. An engineer believes in building something. The point is what? We don't all want the same thing. The Japanese high command, for instance, they want to build one kind of world, I want to build another. Meaning what? Meaning your husband, Jerome Grant, called Jerry. Quite a coincidence picking this up in Egypt. Where did you get it? Where you played governess. Jerry was building something. Irrigation for better poppies. That was his work, helping to make a billion slaves of the next generation. Benda Shaw, that really breaks you down, doesn't it? Nothing we could pin on you as long as we never dug up Benda Shaw. That really hurts, doesn't it? I just want the answer to one question from you. When you were back at the stern watching the gulls, the stuff went over with the garbage, didn't it? Didn't it? Uh, afraid to talk like the rest of them. Well, I'm here to prove it did. And if that's your pal, then I'll know for sure. Now pick that up. Say just one word, hello, and then give it to me. Hello. Oh, Chupin? I just couldn't wait. What did she say? Everything is going fine, Princess. You just wait right there, huh? That wasn't the one, Mrs. Grant. Senor Barrow. Can't stop. You better come. You stay here with her. Watch her. The third fanatic who paid for failure. But this death told me what I wanted to know. And in the chart room, a few minutes later, the first officer was figuring the point where those narcotics had been thrown overboard. Knowing the time it happened, and knowing his course and the speed of the ship, he could pin down within a mile the spot where that stuff must be riding at anchor on ocean bottom. We could guess now what had happened. That stuff must be anchored on ropes that had been chemically treated, wearing away gradually in salt water, with buoys attached. And when those ropes broke, it would rise fast to the surface, and the Gene Hawks ring would be waiting for it. I had put in a call to Coast Guard, and now I ask them for boats to meet the Cardillo on the way in, as fast as they could get to us. Inside of an hour, they were there to take us off. That phony Chinese uncle was under guard in his cabin but I wanted to take Anne Grant along with me. She wouldn't be separated from Shu Pan, so we let her have it her way. It was 10 or 12 miles back to that place, back into enemy waters, with my two cold and worried passengers, 
And the question was, would we make it there in time? How thick was that rope? How fast was it wearing away? It might have broken already and the stuff been picked up. the last of the Gene Hawks ring was herded together. And I had the whole of that narcotics cargo transferred to my boat. And then we headed back. The members of the ring would be taken in to be jailed. But I cut off from the others, taking a course directly into customs to bring in those narcotics. And very likely, Gene Hawks herself. What's your idea, Princess? Put that gun down. Make for a point a mile above Conover Beacon. She's out of her mind. Did you hear what I said? Head for sure, a mile above Conover Beacon. Never heard of Jean Hawks, Mrs. Grant? Jean Hawks? The name that took those narcotics around the world ever since North China. Never heard of it? No. Amazing. Could be our baby-faced Princess. Nearly 20 years old. A Chinese girl for the honor and glory of Japan. My father is attorney general of occupied Manchuria. The tree was bent young, wasn't it? Tell him to go faster. The lady says speed up. Well, what are you going to do? Get this stuff ashore, huh? Where well, the rest of your gang is waiting. And to make sure you get away, you'd have to kill the four people on this boat. That's insane. Gene Hawks would do that without batting an eye. And you had no idea, Mrs. Grant. Didn't know who I was or what happened at Bender Shaw's until I told you. Didn't know your husband was hired by Japan to grow narcotics. And that you've been chaperoning Gene Hawks ever since Pan Yen. You, the respectable widow of an American killed by Japanese bombs. Didn't know that, huh? Or maybe that isn't how he died at all. Maybe he knew too much and wasn't a fanatic he should have been. He wasn't quite. You murdered him. No, you did. With notions of helping China and asking questions. He was told to get rid of you. But couldn't bring himself to do it, huh? Still had a little feeling for his wife. That weakness licked him, didn't it? That's the weakness that licked me, too. The feeling I had for a frightened, helpless little girl. I was a sucker for that, wasn't I? Your side trades in that kind of thing. Decent human feeling. No use for it yourself, except to fake it. But I've been learning fast, Princess, and I learned that lesson just in time. In fact, I had an idea who you were when you got in this boat. You see, after the accident happened, Mrs. Grant was standing by my bed, but not the warm little girl who loved me so much. Where was she? At the stern, watching gulls, I found out a little later. She must have heard about it the same time Mrs. Grant did. 
but made us delayed in coming to find me. That's where I began to learn. I thought back to how a notebook could have been taken out of my pocket in the temple back in Shanghai. And those lines of suffering in that artist's sketch of a young girl could be the madness of a grown woman. I wasn't sure yet about you or Mrs. Grant. So the next step was that note to Randstadter. When he didn't call Mrs. Grant and killed himself, that could mean that you opened the note on the way, told Randstadter he'd failed, and that his services were no longer required. See what I mean, Princess? You can't fake real feelings. Not for long. They're the exclusive property of real human beings. Put down that gun. Come and take it, Mr. Brent. That's a garbage. Notify Coast Guard. A mile above Conover Beacon. That'll be the end of this trail. That was the end of that trail. And the beginnings, you might say, of a fellow named Michael Barrows, narcotics agent. Or as my boss just said today, 12 years later, by this time, I hope, we have learned the deeper lesson that no boundaries between peoples are as important as the simple, common, lasting bond of belonging to the human race. <laughs>